Chairperson of the Friends of the National Gallery. I'd like, you, I'd like to welcome all of you this morning to the opening of our 50th celebrations um, as Friends of the National Gallery and to our opening exhibition. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing two guests. One of them is Dr. Bongani Lovu from the Zigo National Gallery of Core Functions, who I'll call up just now. And the other one is Dr. Ashraf Jamal. I'd like to welcome Dr. Ashraf Jamal to start his talk. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a hand to Dr. Ashraf Jamal. Uh, firstly, good afternoon. Uh, I don't mean to be disingenuous, but I tend to loathe being called doctor. It's one of those things I did because I just happened to be a nerd. But um, I, I'm an academic, so that's, that's about where it stops. Um, Kabani um, asked me a few days ago if I could speak here. Uh, I haven't spent the last three years on this book. I'm rather exhausted with writing things down in the printed form, so I've just made a few thoughts uh, that I wish to generate and discuss. The one I wish to begin with is the obvious one, is that, of course, that museums are not art dealerships. Everybody knows that. Um, they're different cultures. They, they define the, the habitat of art completely differently. And what I understand from the break given to me, what we as a group need to do is think about what it is that museology or museums can do to inhabit, project, share, and communicate art. This is a very different world. Um, the one thing we can definitely say, and I noticed this when I came back in January 1990, the first thing I noted, and this is after many years in Europe and North America, that I've never come across more creative, I'd never come across more creative people in my life as I have when I came back to South Africa in 1990. It astounded me by the depth of the creativity and it still astounds me. So we don't have any problems with generating great artists. That's not our problem. Our problem is trying to understand how it is that we construct the, the reliquaries, and I don't mean to be sacred only, but there are non-sacred ways of containing art as well. But the ways in which we cushion, protect, generate, and communicate an immense national cultural value. That's the main thing. So how do we do that, and how does this particular institution do that? Um, I don't know if anybody knows about this. I just learned it literally, in fact, the night of my, my launch um, from an, an ex-student of mine from Rhodes who now works at Zeitz. And uh, a young woman is caught on screen taking a dump in the sound box in the Isaac Julian room. Has anybody heard of this? It's true. So, I'm not here simply to, to talk about the scandal and, and what is this, what does it mean, and why is it that the excremental seems to have become part of the cultural DNA of our country. And I bring that up because what I'm trying to get at is what is it? So, what are museums? You know, um, very crudely, um, from memory, uh, it's been a number of years since I've read this book, but in many ways the museum, the cultural museum is very much a 19th century phenomenon. And because it was in that point in history with the, with the, with the growth and development of industrialization, for example, let's take Britain, um, that for the first time, the broader public, in other words, the working class, could begin to actually have access to museums. And then it became the great event of Sundays. I don't really recall, I remember when I was a little boy, what I loved most on Sundays is doing window shopping on Adley Street. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. It was one of the, most, the best. That was my museological moment. But what I'm saying is, this is the key thing. It was, it, the, the museums were constructed to actually democratize attendance. And it was done in Britain for that end. Now, the paradox, of course, is, is that in a country like South Africa, has it achieved something comparable? And this is, again, a rhetorical question, one raised to the public to ask you where do you position yourselves in terms of how receptive you think public museums are to the general public. Um, we know, for example, this is very intriguing. So in the uh, mid to late 19th century, you've got the boom of industrialization. What becomes intriguing is when the red brick universities in Britain pop up, and I happen to go to one of them, Sussex. 
They popped up in the 60s and 70s, and suddenly everybody was going to university, so everybody had an access to humanities education, and everybody wanted to know about art. And out of that, you have a massive boom of attendance at the Tate Model, because the nature of education was designed to give as many people access to the arts. Now, this is the issue in our country. To what extent is the arts actually integrated and factored in crucially into the imaginary of an educational system? This is something of such a critical mass that cannot be, uh, that needs to be addressed by all of us. How do we bring uh, the arts back into the general educational sphere? Especially when we are at the point right now when education has technically become a bankrupted idea. I teach, well I, at the moment I teach the mentally malnourished. What I mean by that, I chose to teach the poor and as a consequence after seven years of doing this, my brain is fraying, my heart is completely completely quashed, my resolve is virtually dead, um, how then do I maintain and sustain this belief in the value of education? And I'm not the only one, and this is not only an institution I work at, it's across the board. So if at universities, at tertiary level, there's a bankruptcy and a failure in the educational economy, what do you think is happening at high schools? I have a student, a, teacher, a dear friend of mine, for example, is a Michaelis graduate who teaches at Carinas in Grahamstown. And he basically said to me, Ashraf, this is, a young, this is a man who has a passionate interest in art. In fact, he knows more about African art than any of my colleagues in any art history tertiary institution. And he teaches high school, okay? But he said to me, Ashraf, I look around and all I see are vats of pus and blood and water. I don't see human beings anymore. I know it's a harsh statement to make, but what he's trying to say is that the there's a certain kind of absenting of being that is occurring. Basically, people have been, their lives have been overtaken. They've been, you know, the body snatches. Well, well, literally, this is what happens. So basically, there's no purpose, no purpose, and there's no sense of self, and therefore no real reason to learn anything. Combine that with the, um, the lowering of the high school grade system, you can already see there, even less people will be interested in the artwork. So the key thing, therefore, the number of things that have to happen, we need to have a major, major overall of the educational system. We need to redefine the ideological state apparatuses, which, for example, are Iziko, um, Zeitz, etc., etc., etc. How do they function, and how do they educate, and how do they share, and how do they give back? We also need to do something very important, because the major problem with South Africa, and I've noticed this since, since I came back in 1990, is that we're a deeply slavish culture, deeply deferential, um, we revere far too soon, we don't question effectively enough, and as a consequence we do not rethink effectively what our canon is, what value is and how value operates in the art world. We need to develop a greater criticality in that space because only then will we be able to then rethink the pedigree we've set up, the pedigree of value um, that actually operates and functions, and then become more open to more surprising elements which we could not see, could not understand. I remembered um, at one point giving a talk at the Barnard Gallery, there was a man in the front row, wrapped as I was speaking. I was talking about the, the slums and the ghettos of Africa and why these are the most innovative spaces across the continent. This is not my idea, it's a number of books I've read in the context and developed this notion. And he looked at me very attentively and I thought, this man must know a lot about art history. He came to me and said, no, he's a football scout. But he operates in exactly the same way. He goes to these zones to find innovation, to find those people who have the greater gift. So how then do we integrate that space? And you mentioned this, Kobani, in terms of bringing in, in school children into the space, bringing more and more and more of that integration needs to happen for that to happen, for children to feel that they have a familiar home, away from home. You can't rely on students only using the libraries and the townships as the basis for the known world of the community centers or the churches. But these places, sequestered ones like these, need to be integrated much more deeply into the basis of people's sense of culture. So I would ask you to rethink the value. Well, when I say that, um, <laughs> the work that's right in front of me here is the, um, is the first work in my book. So it was rather ironic when I came in here to see it rearing its head, because I was basically trying to depart, to embark on something. And that, that wonderful moment, I mean, uh, I don't know if anybody knows Delacroix, uh, my all-time favorite painter, but um, the passion and movement and dynamism of that world um, is very much there. Admittedly arrested here, but implicit and potentially in existence. Um, 
So, candidacy to be rethought, we must challenge and redefine the spaces we inhabit um, as well. Um, I'm not sure, I couldn't remember the name, some of you will remember this. I remember when I used to teach Rhodes University, I used to take my students to a museum in the townships in PE. It's called the Red Museum. Red Location Museum. The what? Red Location The Red Location Museum. And it was a travesty. A travesty as a museum, as an aspiration, as a condition. All the pain and agony I felt in entering that space had to do with the immensity of the loss, the immensity of the dream to create a space, create a museum within the townships that could potentially work. But it patently failed entirely to actually create the culture that made it, made it workable as a space. So you can have an, a, an idea of what is good, but you've got to understand damn well that it's actually going to work or not. Which brings me to the grey areas, um, which uh, Winnie was talking about. She also brings to the fact that we must be very careful of PC logic, because political correctness can stunt growth far more rapidly than anything else. Um, I will be finishing very soon. Um, so, what defines the treasures of the nation? The treasures of the nation. This is the key thing. In terms of what do we value and what we um, what, what, what do we truly cherish? Let's think about that. And right now, for example, Norville's about to open at its doors. And what's interesting here, if Norval is, uh, consecrates modernism um, and Zeitz consecrates the millennial culture, then where do we position Ezekiel in all of these spaces? I'll leave it at that. Thank you.